Hello and welcome to another episode of Life Stories Markham. Life Stories is devoted to providing our audience, you, with a deeper understanding of the individuals behind the public persona of those people within our community. Uh, we are your co-hosts. I'm Michael Heap. I'm Nilesh Hathi. And we have a very special guest today with us. He's Brandon himself, garden guru, everybody knows him, Mark Cullen. Mark Cullen. <laughs> All right, Mark. Yeah. Studio Thank applause. You. Yeah, by the way, I didn't brand myself gardening guru. Somebody else did that. <laughs> I never called myself no. the gardening guru. No, no. I called you that. Oh, you called oh, me that. that. That's right. And you are Mark That's Cullen. Good. You branded yourself Mark Cullen. Just Mark Cullen. That's right. Yeah. That, that is the branding yeah. genius of you. Well, that's kind of you to say. So, Mark, first question, why gardening? <laughs> well, kind of, why not? It was, in a way, my pedigree. I, I grew up in the gardening business, the retail gardening business. My father was a landscaper in his early days, in his late teens and 20s, and he became keenly interested in retailing, purchased a piece of property on Shepherd Avenue between Bayview and Leslie in 1948. It was five acres, and he thought this would be a wonderful place to grow evergreens. And his concept was, I'll grow the evergreens, I'll invite the public from North Toronto <laughs> to come up and identify the plant they want, I'll dig it for them, I'll wrap, it, I'll wrap the roots in burlap, put it in their car. And this is before the words cash and carry <laughs> were invented. Right, right. And it was really cash and carry. And it yeah. was retail before gardening retail yeah. existed because before then Canadians bought all of their plants yes. by mail order. Really? They did. Wow. They did. And the biggest nurseries in the country, like McConnell, oh, for instance, uh, um, Sears had a huge nursery down there, uh, down in uh, Port Burwell and around Lake Erie. They were all mail order. But I would think back then mail order wouldn't be very quick like it is now. It's not like Connell and Amazon, same day delivery. I don't know. They de delivered mail twice a day. Back in the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back oh. before the Depression. Right. Right. So, you know, the interesting thing garden, uh, to me, I find the gardening history in Canada really quite interesting mm -hmm. because there's been quite an evolution, really. And in the beginning days, of course, it evolved rather slowly, but more recently, very, very quickly. Okay. Uh, evolution because of weather, because of just... Demographics, demographics, the economy, the urbanization of the country. Mm -hmm. You know, think about... 1867, the majority of us were farmers. We lived in rural areas, yes. right? Uh, but, but today, 2% of the people employed in the country are farmers. So there's yes. th those two statistics right. you know, tell you a lot about the changing demographics of Canada and the way retailing has evolved, oh. not just in horticulture, but elsewhere yeah. as well. And you mentioned 1867, the year of Confederation, over 150 years ago. Yeah. And you have an item you've brought today <laughs> that this book, I believe, was it not printed in 1867? It was printed in 1867. It's called The Wildflowers of Canada. Right. And it was a promotional piece created by the Montreal Gazette. Uh, and it's, it's, it's fascinating to me because it's full of color wow. renderings. Yeah. Right. Which, for its time, you know, was kind right. of rare. Right. Uh, but this was, after all, one of Canada's largest newspapers at the time. And uh, it's full of all kinds of detail about the native plants of Canada, which were important to Canadians back then. Mm -hmm. And funny thing, they've become extremely important to Canadians in recent times. Right, right. So what was native back then that still is native? Like, what, do you, what is the long-standing Canadian flower? Oh my goodness. Here, you read the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, let's, let's begin with what is a Canadian, a native Canadian flower. And, and the answer, I believe, is a, a, f a flowering plant that existed here on its own before the Europeans arrived on our okay, soil. Right. Sure. So 500 years ago, let's say, give or take, 500 years ago. Sure. If it existed here, it would qualify as a native flower. And there are a lot of flowers we think are native actually are not. They're, they're imposters, like the dandelion. Dandelion came from Italy. It was yeah, brought here right. intentionally 200 years ago or so as a coffee substitute. <laughs> really? That's true. So chicory and dandelion root have a lot in common. And if you can't get coffee, just try to imagine a, a Toronto, Markham, in 17... 
1893, when we were founded here by uh, William Bursey, try to imagine what it was like to get a pound of coffee. It was tough, <laughs> right. right? You have to imagine yes. where it came from, yeah. right? So people use dandelions as a substitute. Mm -hmm. And they're used today for a lot of other reasons. I don't think anybody uses them as coffee no, substitutes. I don't think so. No, no. I don't uh, think But so. the greens are very nutritious, nutritious and the rest is history. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, so growing up, you're a teenager. You're growing up yeah. in Aging Court, yeah. North Scarborough. And your father has a business, uh, um, Wheel and Cullen, I we, guess. Was Wheel the, and Cullen. Right. Yeah. Now, as a teenager, did you have an interest in it or was it just something your, your father did? Well, I did have an interest in it, Mike, and I developed an interest because, I, quite frankly, I love to sell. I love people. I'm a very social person by nature. I was, I am, and I, what I love most of all was following my dad into work when I was 13 years old, and I would have worked for nothing. I never told him that. So he, <laughs> he actually paid me something, but it wasn't much. It, it would have been like a buck ninety an hour yeah. or something. But I, I, rem I remember following him to work to, the, to his store on Shepherd Avenue between Bayview and Leslie and Willowdale. And I just, I spent all the March break there. I spent all of the summer there. I spent as much time as I could there. And through osmosis, you could say, through the experience of meeting and greeting the public and meeting their needs. I mean, what is, after all, the whole essence of selling? It's meeting people's people. needs and wants, yeah, right. right? Sure. And so in doing that, I had to answer a lot of questions. And by the time I was 16 years old, I could answer most of the questions people had when they came into the garden. Wow. Center. Whether it was about disease and insects, or whether it was about the best plant for the shade, or a plant that flowered for a long period of time and came back every year. All those questions, came every day, every day, one after the other after the other. And I listened. I listened to the people that worked for my father and I learned from them. I did not work directly for my father for a long time until my mid-twenties. But in those early days, I listened to a guy named Case, Case, uh, Ben, Case, uh, oh gee, his last name just suddenly lost. Okay. But he was Dutch. Yeah, right. And he was a Second World War vet. He, uh, during, he was in the Netherlands, um, Moorleg, Case Moorleg. He was in the Netherlands during the Second World War and he worked for the underground and he had amazing stories about life there in those times and the lack of food, the lack of money, the lack of resources, trying to raise a family. And I listened to him because he was brilliant. He had a mind for this business like nobody I've ever met before or since. And a person would come in with a really obscure question or a leaf and say, can you identify this for me? He could not only identify it, he knew the botanical name, wow. he knew its cultural wow. needs, he knew everything. And I just listened to Case, and he became my idol. Uh, and I listened to him probably for about six years before I broke loose, and I took on some other responsibilities. Wow. So, you must have a great memory then as well. I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not as good as it was. <laughs> so you were a seller marketer, and became a gardening expert. I, I, I suppose I did. Yeah, right? Yes, yeah, and I suppose. You're, you still see yourself as selling every day? Well, I, I, I don't see myself as a gardening expert. I never did, I don't now. Wow. This is something other people have put on me. And uh, I, but I do my, see myself as an advocate, a very passionate advocate for the, for the benefits of the gardening experience. Yeah. Now that, I see myself as. And it's not the technical stuff like how wide the hole should be, how deep it should be, whether the right tree for the right place, all this stuff. Well, that interests me. It doesn't interest me nearly as much as do you garden? If you don't garden, what can I tell you that might tempt you to try? And if you do garden, how can I tempt you to garden more? Those right. are the two questions that got me up every morning from my 20s right through. So you said when you, people came and asked you lots of questions about gardening, yeah. what is the most asked question? <laughs> the most asked question would, well, it depends on who's asking. You know, if it's a new gardener, if right. it's a first time gardener, they want to know how not to fail. Right. And there are two answers to that. Number one, Soil preparation is everything. That's 90% of your success is soil preparation. It's the unbeautiful part of growing a, a plant, right? right? 
The other answer is there's nothing wrong with failure. Like when you garden, embrace failure because really failing is nothing more than a composting opportunity. <laughs> right. Where when you think about it, sure. in the rest of life, in our family, in our religious life, in our, our work life, we, we're trained not to fail, right? And when you're in the garden, you can fail all you want and you learn every time you do. Now, did your father instill that in you? Failure is okay? Or was this... <laughs> well, he kind of did. And I'm thinking about the, the day I smashed his car up. <laughs> I've done that. <laughs> did you do that? Yeah, I did that. <laughs> All right. I'm uh, 19 years old and I rear-ended a guy oh, in right. his car. Oh. And he was in Florida at the time. So he comes home and I said, Dad, I'm sorry, your car's not in the garage. It's in the other garage <laughs> right. and getting, getting fixed. So anyway, he went and he saw the dealership and he arranged to, he arranged to get the front end all fixed up. And um, I said, Dad, I feel so terrible. I said, I'll, I'll pay for it. And he said, I don't want your money. He said, I just don't want you to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And, I, I, and you know, as I reflect on that now, what a great response. You did it, you learned something. Sure. Just don't do it again. Yeah. Like, right. whatever you learned from that. And you know what? I never did do it again. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you learned. I've come yeah. close, yeah. but I've never <laughs> done it since. <laughs> so, Mark, you were working uh, for your father's business. You've been there a few years. You've been gaining a lot of knowledge about the field. And at some point, you branched out into media. Can you yeah. tell us how that happened? Well, you know, this is where competition can be such a good thing. Because, quite frankly, at Wheel and Cullen, we had six stores when I entered the business in 1978. Okay. And I bought my father out in 1988. So I could, there was a trajectory there during which I, I could see that um, our number one competitor was eating our lunch, and that was White Rose. White Rose, at that time, had 13 locations in the, in the GTA. We had six. They had an ad like this in the Toronto Star every Friday. We had an ad like this, same paper. Right. Um, what do you do when you know you're the underdog? And it occurred to me at a very young age that wherever I went, there were gardening questions. It was if I went to a so-called cocktail party, for instance, I was the doctor in the room. And people would say, oh, you know, oh, how do I reflower my hydrangea? Or, you know, how do I get rid of the slugs on my hosta? And I, and, and I had fun with that. Sure. Um, I had fun with that. And I came to the realization that there was a vacuum of information out there. There was and there is today, still. Even with the internet, there is a vacuum of information. And I know that because it still happens. Wherever I go, there is a gardening question. And I think you mentioned <laughs> that you had a gardening question outside when, yes. we, when I leave. I'm ready for it. <laughs> and it happens everywhere I go. Uh, great to see you, Mark. Uh, can you help me with this? <laughs> uh, I get a beer. Yeah, really? Yeah, really. Absolutely. I'll do anything for a beer. <laughs> but realizing that, realizing that this vacuum existed, motivated me to fill the vacuum with free gardening information. So I came up here to Markham. And uh, I, I came to see the publisher of an independent uh, newspaper at the time. And I went to 10 others and I said, how would you like a gardening column? Eh, I don't really need a gardening column, but thanks. No, what, how about a free gardening column? Oh, well, that would be interesting. <laughs> and I'll do it every week and I'll send it to you by fax. And I'll meet your deadlines and you tell me what you want. I'll deliver it to you. I have only one request. I want a byline. Mark Cullen, Wheel and Cullen Nurseries. Right. Yeah, okay. Didn't cost them anything to yeah. do that. Mm -hmm. So that's how I started, yeah. 1981. And in 1983, I got a phone call from uh, CKY Radio in Toronto, which is now the Fan 590. Yeah. Okay. But at the time, they were doing a big format change. They had been a music-based AM sure. station. They were moving into talk radio. Would I throw my name in the hat for a brand new, a brand new program called Rescue Radio? And Fridays, it was every day from eleven weekday from eleven till noon, and on Fridays from eleven till noon was gardening. Oh. Yeah, I will, sure, and I'll do it for free, and I did it for free for a number of years, and then um, 
Five years into that, I got a call from CFRB. So CKUI was the number 12 radio station in Toronto. And yet, I had 50,000 listeners. And I remember thinking, that's about what you can get in what was then the Sky Dome or Rogers Centre, right? Yeah, like, that's, that's right. a lot of people. Mm-hmm. I'm sure. speaking to a lot of people when I'm behind the mic talking to one person, the host. Just. So when CFRB called, I, could, I looked at their ratings and I could say they were a multiple of that, sure. like 300,000 on a Saturday morning. And they right. needed a, they had a gardening show, they wanted a replacement. Threw my hat in that ring, I got going with that. Then Canada AM. Did then you have a free? I didn't have to. <laughs> I didn't have to because people, people then were saying, no, no, we're going to pay you. Yeah. So, at, at, and, and so then you, eventually. So you accepted their money. I, <laughs> I, I did. I said, well, okay, if you have to. But you know, you've written for free, then you're on the radio for free. I think yeah, I know. It's, it's true. <laughs> um, and then, um, uh, you know, I've written 23 books. Yeah. And if you're a Canadian author, you're probably writing books for free. Yeah, probably. Right, probably, and if not for free, and I mean that is yeah, partly as a right. joke, but yeah. the truth is, yeah, Canadian authors don't. There are very few authors right. in Canada, uh, notwithstanding Margaret Atwood and one or two others, who are actually making a living or right. could make a living doing what they're doing. The rest of us do it because we have a passion for sure. for the material, right? Yeah. So, twenty-three different books you've written, yeah. and so what would be the genesis of an idea for a new book? With just something you thought of, or does somebody approach you? Both. Actually, both. Uh, uh, sometimes a publisher, I published for Penguin for a number of years and then Random House. Okay. And my publishers, as they got to know me, came up with their own ideas. And so some of those books were the genesis was my publisher, um, maybe my editor, uh, maybe it was sort of a, a consortium of ideas that, that, that happened at a table just yeah. like this. Um, yeah, so I can't say that there was just one way that it happened, all sure. 23. And right. two of the books weren't about gardening, two of them were biographies. Oh. I have a very keen interest in, in people, and I happen to know a Second World War vet who invited me to go to Juneau Beach. He had landed on D Day, right. and he asked me to go. Uh, his name was uh, Hugh Beatty, he's passed now. Mm-hmm. But uh, we got over there and he started talking and I got out my computer and I said, you mind if I write this down? He's telling me stuff he hasn't told his family. And then finally I said, you know what, Hugh, this is a story and I'd like to write a book. And he said, you can't write a book. Nobody wants to to hear my story. But we wrote a book. And it it was for me a life transforming experience to have a man bear his soul at the age of 94 and tell me things that he'd never told his family never took the time to tell his wife who had passed about 10 years before that. What an experience that was, mm-hmm. really. Well, I worked at CBC and CBT TV for many years. And, you know, I was a video editor back in the day. And I edited stories on a documentary, Nolton Nash, about D-Day plus 50. What an experience that is, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And then and I got the opportunity to go to, to Holland for the VE Day plus 50, right? Wow. And, it was, and we were sitting there in the town, town hall, sitting there just setting up and stuff. And this woman came in with a with a plate full of muffins, makes me cry today. And she says, 50 years ago, you fed us today, I'm gonna feed you. And you're like, oh, oh my God, wow. wow. Like, it's just like, the war stories are like, yeah. right? they get you, yeah. right? That's, that's what it's about, I think. They do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so. So Canada AM, yeah. you and I worked Canada AM. We did. Yeah, we did. it was a lot of fun. You had a lot of fun. I had so much fun. I did a lot of TV. I, yeah. did, I had my own show I, um, on, on, first of all, on CBC, then CTV. Um, and then two iterations on HGTV, but nothing yeah. was as much fun as Canada AM. Can you it tell was... us about a typical interaction that you might have had, the two of you? Okay, on the well, show? let me tell Hang on. I have something for you. Oh. I have a special message for Canada AM. Oh. Okay, ready? Yeah. Do I know Mark Cullen or have any life stories? Well, I'll tell you what, when you spend 15 years with a guy, uh, seeing him, you know, at least uh, 15 times a year taping segments that ran on Canada AM 50 times a year. That means I had 750 interactions with him. And I can tell you this, he's a kind, passionate, wonderful human being. And boy, his passion just doesn't get in the way of anything. And I'll give you a couple of examples here. So we would be taping these gardening segments. And like I said, over 700, and I'm still the world's worst gardener. 
but he would come up with these lines that would just knock me off my feet, but he would just keep going like nothing happened. For example, there was a time he said to me, Jeff, do you know the purpose of a hoe? <laughs> That's the reaction I had. And he said, and you have to sharpen it with a bastard file. So Mark just keeps on rolling. I mean, there was another time we were taping a segment and he was wrapping burlap around a tree and winter was on the way. And he said, Jeff, do you know why we're wrapping burlap around these trees? And I said, no, Mark, why are we doing that? He said, to break wind. <laughs> so away we go. But one of my favorite was Mark has a beautiful home north of Toronto and he has some fruit trees there, including a pear tree. And almost near one of our last ever segments, I remember saying to him, I was standing outside under this tree and I said, gee, Mark, it looks like you finally grew a pair. And he said, well, I've grown several, in fact, never skipping a beat. Consummate professional, passionate industry leader, Order of Canada winner. Boy, Mark Cullen, he's the whole package. <laughs> <laughs> so good to see Jeff again. Uh, he hasn't aged a day. Yet. Hasn't at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and he, he'll never change. Jeff will always be Jeff. Yeah. I could have predicted the three stories he would want to tell you. Yes, because yeah. he, th what was most fun about working with Jeff is if I threw him a bone, he always did something with oh, yeah. it. Always. <laughs> so if we were, th that that story about the pair, you know, I, I, I looked at him, I said, do you like a nice pair? <laughs> like, he absolutely... <laughs> cracked That's up yeah. and there were there were moments when we laughed so hard we were on the ground it never went to air because it couldn't go to air <laughs> yeah. right? really? and I'm not sure the pair went to air no, either it it wouldn't, air. if it did it shouldn't have no that's right it didn't um, go to air but no. but but we it was just spontaneous fast He's very smart. Yeah. He is, I mean, he is just a very, very smart individual. Anybody with a wit that moves that quickly. And, is smart. and he has a photographic memory as well. He remembers totally. everything. Totally. Everything. That's true. Yeah. He, he will tell you when he went. Well, he will tell you where he was that day. He said, and what he did before and afterwards today. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Wow, incredible. So Jeff worked in Canada. For those who don't know, Jeff Hutchison worked in Canada for many years. Yeah. And then until the show got canceled, and uh, he now lives in PEI. Happily in PEI. Well, right. and I, I sometimes wonder if he hadn't retired, if it might still be on the air. Yeah. Is it it's just true. a coincidence that yeah. he was leaving that day, and That's they right. decided, well, we might as well just cancel. Without Jeff, it's not a show. Really, so the two things were he was already scheduled to leave the yeah. show, yes. and then they decided to. Yeah, yeah. and there stuff. had been like quite a frufera around his That's leaving, right. and yeah, yeah. And Jeff, I know you'll be watching this. Mark Cullen has an order of Canada as well. <laughs> 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 Tell us about that, Mark. Yes. Tell us about the moment of getting an order. Of Canada. Well, I, I could probably thank Jeff partly for that because you know it's it's just a whole mess of things that that got thrown in the hopper and people who earn. And I say earn the uh, Order of Canada are, are um, how can I put it, academics, they're doctors, they're lawyers, they're, they're not gardeners. There's one other gardener uh, that, that, that um, received the Order of Canada and that was Brian Minter before me. And Brian, Brian is uh, uh, in British Columbia, a very good friend of mine, and uh, he deserved it. He received it many, many years before I did. My point being, here we have an industry that employs over a quarter of a million Canadians. Half of them are in the private sector, the other half are in the public sector. Uh, it is uh, an, an economic contributor to the, uh, to the economy. Uh, it makes the country greener, more beautiful. It's environmentally responsible. It is so many things. It gives people therapy and life and good health. Mm -hmm. And there are two orders of Canada that are connected with it. You know, I, I just feel that it's just a great privilege to have received it for the work that I did, largely in the media, but also uh, with the reforestation of the highway heroes. That was mentioned in my commendation when I received it. Yeah. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. But I want to say, do you remember the moment when you got the call and how you felt? Oh, absolutely. Um, I do. I was in Jasper. I was, uh, I was doing a review for Communities in Bloom, which is a national competition between communities across the country. Um, and I was in a van with about four women who uh, were hosting me in Jasper and they were taking me around right. to the seniors location and the uh, senior center and to uh, the, the local community garden and one thing or another, get the phone call and uh, they said, it's so-and-so calling from the governor general's office. I'm calling to tell you that 
you've received okay. the uh, a member, yeah. you will become a member of the Order of Canada. And I just about, <laughs> first of all, I didn't believe her. I asked her to repeat it. And then the people in the car are all silent, and they're listening to me respond. So I put the phone down, and I said, they tell me I'm getting the order in Canada. Yeah. And then I pick it up again, and she says, and don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget it. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, you guys, don't say anything. <laughs> wow. I had to keep in a seat. It was June. It was, it was June, June. Uh, 20, uh, 2016, and I don't think I was inducted until um, the following February. Mm -hmm. And they, they didn't announce it until, I know what it was, Ju July 1st. Right. They always announced right. July 1st, January 1st. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. yeah, so I didn't have to keep quiet for too long. Yeah, It's good, because you're not a quiet yeah. person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I my wife would agree with you. <laughs> but you mentioned the Highway of Heroes, mm. and I believe, was it last year that you planted the last tree? We did. For the Highway of Heroes campaign? And so many Canadians and people watching may not know much about that uh, campaign. Maybe you can tell people about it. You know, it, it, that's interesting, Mike. It was uh, an eight-year uh, wonderful run where we hatched, I say we, uh, there were a number of people, Michael DePoncier, Tony DiGiovanni, and myself, thought it would be a good idea to plant more trees in the urban environment across the country because Toronto's tree canopy was going like this, Markham Street canopy was going like this, right. the emerald ash borer was coming in and it was gobbling up a huge canopy. And we understood the value of the urban tree canopy to urbanites, to Canadians who live in, in urban areas. And that's 80% of us, right? right? The health benefits, the economic benefits, the environmental benefits. And I can't get into them. We don't have time for that. But I can tell you that after about two years of spinning our wheels trying to figure out how are we going to plant more trees in the urban environment, Tony said, why don't we reforest the Highway Heroes trees? Uh, high, highway Heroes. Now, excuse me. Between Toronto, Keel Street, that's the coroner's office, and CFB Trenton, there's 170 kilometers. We wanted to plant a tree for every Canadian lost at war since the War of 1812, 117,000 trees. And this is on Highway 401. On correct? Highway 401, yes. thank you. Mm -hmm. On Highway 401, on the right of way. So it took us a year to negotiate an agreement with the MTO, right. Ministry of Transportation. And then we thought, but that's not enough trees. Like, we want to make a difference here. Let's plant a tree for every Canadian that volunteered for military service during times of war, which was two million. Two. Now we were getting closer, closer to a number that we thought would make an impact, an environmental impact, an impact on future generations as they drove down the highway. And now we could actually transform the experience of driving down the highway. This barren black strip yes. of asphalt, right? right? And so, Two and a half million trees is what we planted. Ten million dollars is what we raised. Four thousand Canadian vol volunteered to help plant. Thirty-five hundred individual Canadians donated their own hard-earned cash. Wow. That was our campaign. Wow, incredible! And ensuring that a tree in that environment survives was probably a challenge as well. And expensive. So I mean, you could do the math: two and two and a half million trees, ten million dollars. It's, it's not a simple case of just a spade in the ground and a tree. Like, this is not how it works. Soil remediation was 80% of our cost. Wow. And the, and the reason is highways are not built for tree planting. Right, of course. Right. They're engineered, they're engineered yeah. for safety and to minimum maintenance. Right. And I learned that. I learned a lot about highways. <laughs> and I learned that the MTO is run by primarily engineers. We don't really like trees, to be honest with you. So it was not an easy sell, but in the end, they were very cooperative, and they they understood what we were trying to do. And some of the money came from the Ontario government, the Canadian government as well. They gave us three million dollars. Uh, Justin Trudeau came down to pull to um, Camp X in Oshawa and did a special presentation um, uh, in 2018 million dollars on that occasion and then the, and half the money came from the private sector five million dollars okay. people like you and me and then uh, what the last million dollars came from the MTO itself yes. this was the, la the, the only money we got from them but it was a million dollars 10% yeah. of the campaign Caroline Marooney 
gave it to us and said to me, this has come out of our tree planting budget for the MTO because you plant trees that live. Ah. <laughs> and we had, we had figured that out. We, sure. we had used protocols that were developed um, in, in Vineland at the research station in Vineland, the horticultural research right. station. Uh, and those protocols made all the difference. 85% right. survival rate. Wow. Incredible. And how much soil is that? Did you have to use? That is a lot. So, right? That's, <laughs> That's a lot of soil, lot. right? That's a shit load of soil. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no. Can you say that? <laughs> yeah, of course you can. Oh, well, I did. Yeah, we're on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> it was, yeah, uh, and it's not soil, it's compost. 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 Mm. Wow. wow. Yeah, and we had some great partners that gave us compost. Miller Compost, just, yeah. uh, you know, just up here in Gormley, yeah. were extremely generous. Yes. and. A lot of other Landscape Ontario members were very, very generous. Well, you can't do a project like that without support from the community and people, right? Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. And if I learned one thing, that was it. Okay. And there's another project too you're involved in, maybe still are. Is it Trees for Life? Yes. So, yeah. you know, when David Johnston, previous Governor General, came and planted the last tree at Fort York on November 2nd last year, we put a bow on the Highway Hero Street campaign. Right. And Philip Crawley, the publisher of the Globe and Mail, gave a fabulous speech that day. And um, the founders, we got together like we're sitting right now. We said, well, what are we going to do now? Go home. <laughs> like, we got to win. We've learned a lot. There are things we wouldn't do the same. There are things we would. And we decided what we would do is we would develop a new, a, a new organization called Trees for Life treesforlife.ca, if you like. You can go online, you can see the work we're doing. And at the same time, Trudeau had developed this plan to plant two billion trees. You've probably heard of it. Yes. Yep. And it's, it's, a, it's a very ambitious plan. Yeah. And he was looking for partners. So we put up our hand and we said at the very beginning, if you give us money, we'll match it because we know how to raise money to plant trees. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll plant trees for our healthcare workers. COVID had just Right. And it got underway. <clears throat> and we were all saying thank you to our healthcare workers, first responders, military, all the people who really put their lives on the line for, for us, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so we started this campaign, and it's ongoing to this day. Sure. Uh, we have a three year campaign right now of $2 million a year for the next three years, $6 million <clears throat> okay. in the next three years from the private sector, which will be matched three times once by the public sector and twice by our tree planting partners. Mm. Wow. <laughs> and that goal of two billion trees that Justin Trudeau set, Yeah. Um, when do you think that's achievable? Do you have a, <coughs> an idea? Well, their goal was 10 years and it's three years in. It's not gonna happen in seven years. Okay. And I can tell you that because <clears throat> they can't grow the trees fast yeah. enough. Like the <laughs> right. industry isn't big enough. There's not enough trees. Not yet, <laughs> right? not yet. But you know, credit to the Ministry of Natural Resources and, and Trudeau for, I think, a really good effort. Um, partners like Trees for Life help a lot because mm -hmm. we aggregate their funds. Sure. If, you, if you take the money they've set aside, they'll never plant two billion trees. But if you take that money, you match it with public money, and you match that with partners' money who That's want, and as I say partners, municipalities, yes. like the city of Markham, mm -hmm. Yeah. for instance, conservation authorities that have a budget for tree planting. We, when we talk to these people and we say, what's your budget for tree planting? Well, it's X. And we say to them, how would you like to make it 2X or 3X? Yes. Like mm -hmm. we can help you plant a lot more than what you currently have budgeted. Do you have the real estate? Do you have the resources to make it happen? If we could bring the cash, the in-kind, the compost, right. the landscapers, the boots in the ground, the volunteers, and you know, these conversations are fascinating. And this is mostly in urban areas, right? I think, right? Yes. So yes. how challenging is it now? Because everybody's all about oh, building high rises and more construction and more development. So how challenging is it to convince municipalities and, and governments to plant trees? Convincing them to plant trees is not that difficult now. And in a way, I think this is a sweet spot in our history in Canada where Canadians generally, and people in authority like municipal politicians and politicians of every stripe, yeah. have a basic understanding of the health and environmental benefits of trees. We're not spending a lot of time explaining that. They seem to know intuitively, this is a good idea. It's actually the best 
investment a government can make in green infrastructure is a tree because it's nature's wow. breathing yeah. machine. So, mm -hmm. Now, when you think about that, nature's breathing machine, I'm reminded of how we're so worried about IT. You know, yeah. IT is going to take over the world. Computers are going to start thinking, outthinking <laughs> humans. Yes. AI. Yeah. Right. Yeah. AI. Sorry. What did I say? IT. Yeah. You're right. AI. And thank you, Mike. It's part of but IT. Yeah. Nobody is saying that AI is going to take over the role of trees. And the reason is we haven't actually invented anything as efficient at producing oxygen and cleaning the air as a tree. We don't have anything. Right. So the hand of man has created a lot of very cool things, right? Yeah. But it hasn't, it hasn't found anything, hasn't invented anything as efficient as a tree. We were, uh, we were hiking up from Mount Assiniboine, uh, 7,000 days on a seat in the, in the Alberta BC border. Okay. And 7,000 feet, and you get off the helicopter, and it's like the freshest smell you've ever had in your life, right? Yeah. It's like Christmas all the time. It's amazing. Right. right. And that's what you, you know, that's what you miss down here in urban society, right? Yeah. It's right. that fresh, clean smell. Now, you just recently went up to the Arctic. I did. And that would have been a great experience. It was. It and was. tell us about how important it is up there. Well, uh, it was for me a life transforming experience because I am a tree hugger, and there's no trees. Right. Ah. But there's ice. Right. And there's, there's a culture, there's, there's the Inuit. Uh, whom, you know, us Southerners, they refer to us as Southerners. Yes, okay. um, we really have, I think, a very poor understanding of the situation up there. And I, in the nine days I was there, and I was there with the Rideau Hall Foundation, um, interviewing um, people, beneficiaries of, uh, of the uh, Rideau Hall's work up there, and the, um, the attempts that have been made by Southerners to make life better for the Inuit, right? Yeah. And get some measure of that. That's why we were there. Uh, and, and I came back with uh, my eyes wide open. Wide, open. wide, yeah. wide open. In what sense? Well, for one thing, there is our culture, our history, and there's theirs. And there's a gap. And it could go this way, it could go this but there's a gap. Sure. And I think anybody that's been up there knows that there's a gap. And so, uh, how do you close the gap? How, how, how do we change things in such a way that the Inuit can actually help themselves get out of the mess they're in? And they're in a mess. And we put, we put them in that mess. 150 years ago, yeah. we started. We still the, that mess. We, we really did. And yeah. it's, more, it's more than residential schools. Yeah. There are actually some very good stories about residential schools. We hear the bad stories, but there are bad stories we don't hear as well. And you know, you put it all together and you have a culture that's trying to, you have a race of people that are trying to, to reinvent their culture. I think that's the best way I can put it. Okay. So the culture they had 150 years ago when the Europeans arrived has been def decimated, decimated. Somebody in Ottawa in the late 50s thought it was a good idea to authorize the RCMP to go to the Arctic and shoot the Huskies. That's what they did. It's hard to believe, right. but somebody thought, somebody thought, yeah, well, the way to convert these people to white culture is to take away their ability to hunt. <laughs> and of course it backfired, famously it backfired. Exactly. And a lot of the problems they're experiencing today are a result of just basically the culture being pulled right out from underneath them. Right. And uh, that's just one example of why. It's not just residential schools, it's other stuff that went on. Uh, and denying them their ability to speak their own language. You right. know, all kinds of things, all yeah, kinds sure. of things. Yeah. So um, I, it, I don't mean to sound negative because I think there's a lot of hope, but we have to let them lead the way. We have to back away and let them lead the way. They are the only people who can figure out how to help their own people. And where we're needed, I think we should be there. But Nunavut's only 25 years old. Right. It's a very young, you could say nation within a nation, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and I don't think I'm going to live long enough to see the solutions evolve. I wish I, I wish I could. Sure. Yeah. And this is David Johnson's foundation. Does some, Correct. Does some the the Rideau Hall Foundation. Does some great work. Well, David, yeah. David Johnson started it and he has done yeah. amazing work. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we could talk a lot about you know, the criticism that, that, that was shot his way in May and June 
um, with regards to uh, the Rideau Hall Foundation, but the truth is the money that he received after serving the country as our, as our general, our governor general, he multiplied that oh, yeah. many, many times. And nobody happened to mention that when they were busy sniping. Exactly. Sure. Yeah, people yeah. Right. Yeah. So Mark, you have lots of passion for gardening. I do. What else do you have passion for? <laughs> and trees. And trees, yes. And now six grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay, there we go. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Are either of you grandparents? No. Not no, yet. No. Not, oh, well, you know, nobody can prepare you for this experience. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's wonderful. We just had uh, our, our most recent uh, Matilda. Matilda mm -hmm. was born the 8th of January this year in London, England, because I have a daughter that lives there, married mm -hmm. a Brit. She's not coming home <laughs> permanently. She, right. She's visiting lots. But, you know, I have been thinking about the fact that 2100, when it rolls around, I won't be here. We won't we'll be, be here. here. Mm -hmm. She'll be 77 years old. God willing, wow. yeah. she'll wow. be 77 but, years old, wow. you know? Yes. Um, that could very easily happen. Absolutely, sure. and hopefully it will. Yeah, and yeah. hopefully it will. Yeah. And you know, when we have children, I'm reminded that our horizon is lifted. Right. And then when we have grandchildren, our horizon is lifted further. So all of a sudden, the problems of the day, whatever they are, what, name them, like whether it's homelessness or inflation or the price of houses or whatever, when you're looking 77 years into the future, things have a different perspective, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's where, where parenthood and grandparenthood is good for us in ways that are sometimes hard to articulate. We just know that it's good for us, right? And right. so yeah. we engage ourselves in that experience, and I'm there. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. Any other passions? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, are you, uh, well, gardening, it's funny, you mentioned gardening like that says it all. Yeah. But the truth is I'm much more passionate about gardening with native plants and pollinators mm -hmm. and creating pollinator corridors, trees we've talked about. I'm much more passionate about those things and I probably wouldn't even have mentioned them 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. If you go back and read my first hardcover book, which was published in 1990, some years ago, you'll see a very different Mark Cullen message than you would today in my more recent books. Interesting. Yes. So you've evolved as well. Uh, the I've very guy. much changed. Yeah. I have very much changed. I thank my son for that because yeah. we've been in business together now for eight years. And how is that? What's oh. it like? You, you're in business with your father, yeah. your son's in business with you. What is that like? Well, it's like the ham and the sandwich. You know, I spent all those years learning from my father. Yeah. Now I'm learning from my son. <laughs> <laughs> so you're the ham and the sandwich. I okay. am. Okay. <laughs> he'd probably agree with that. Right. <laughs> But yeah, exactly, and you know, it's a wonderful experience. Uh, yeah. He's, first of all, a great kid, strong work ethic. Um, he, he asks lots of questions, um, and he's not afraid to speak up. Right. And I mean that in a very good yeah. way. He's not afraid to speak up. He's very passionate about the environment. He married a very green girl, and they ha they're going to raise a very green son. <laughs> and and um, he did some work for, uh, Michael, uh, Schne not Schneider, um, you know, the, the, the Green Party leader in oh, Ontario. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Michael, uh, what's his name? Yeah. yeah, we know his name. We all know who he is. That's right. Yes. Well, Ben was part of his campaign. Oh, I mean, that's how green he is, yeah. right? Right. And right. Um, I learn from Ben every day. I really do. Sure. And so we, the last book I wrote, I actually co-wrote with Ben. Wow. And it was called, I should have brought a copy. It's called Escape to Reality. And yeah. it's about when we talk es about escaping to reality, we don't often really mean going for a walk in the woods, but that's an escape to reality because that is reality, escaping especially kind to, of, reality, to reality, not from it, but not from too. reality, right? Yeah. So our reality may be, you know, the four walls that we call home, but uh, the real reality that we are a part of because we are a product of nature. Sure is out there and it starts in your backyard. So if you said to me, what is a garden? I would say a garden is your first introduction to nature. Go out in your backyard. That's the first step to, to engaging yourself and getting to know the natural world of which you are a part. Right. And he's taught me that. In Britain. I, I would not have said that 10 years yeah. ago. Sure. Wow. It's interesting because in Britain, in the UK, yeah. they, call, they don't say backyard, they say garden. That's true. Right? Yeah, yeah that's true. Good garden. Good garden. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
This is very, you were telling us about this uh, earlier the, before we started the show. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. You're a history buff but, and history. Yeah. Of well, I love oh. history. I, I read a lot of history books and, and, and fictional history as well. But uh, my experience in television ex extended to a, a stint with uh, HGTV mm -hmm. back in the day when they actually did gardening shows. <laughs> and, um, we had a, building shows. Yeah, it, and we had a lot of fun for five years. I produced a show, I hosted a show rather, called Mark Cullen Gardening. And that was their idea. I, I, wanted, I wanted to call it the joy of gardening. And they said, nah, <laughs> we're gonna call it Mark Cullen Gardening. Okay, well, whatever. So we went to the Netherlands. And interesting thing about the tulip bulb, which is so easy to take for granted. You've got a few tulips sure. growing in your front yard, you know, big deal. Um, we have the Tulip Festival in Ottawa. It's the largest tulip festival outside of the Netherlands mm -hmm. in the world. Okay. And there's a lot of history behind the tulip bulb. What happened was in 15, I don't have my glasses on, 96, I think that yeah. says, okay. uh, the Dutch ambassador to Turkey saw these tulips growing in a field and he dug up some bulbs and he brought them and gave them to the king yeah. of the Netherlands as a gift from Turkey. And the Dutch, smart people that they are, started to hybridize them. And eventually we ended up with that classic Darwin hybrid yeah. tulip we know today. Right. Well, I went to the Hortus bulborum in Hilligan uh, with uh, HGTV. This is in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands. Yeah. And the original tulip species is in bloom at the museum right. in a little plot, just a little bigger than this table. And I got down on my haunches with the uh, executive director of the Hortus Bulborum. And I, <clears throat> I said to him, can I pick one of these? It blooms for two days by the air. I happen to be there. Days. Just wow. two days. It's nothing to look at. Right. And, and I said, can I pick one? And he says, <clears throat> yeah, but just one. So I picked it. I addressed the camera. We talked about it. <clears throat> and we talked about this called Hort van Do. That's the original tulip. Yeah. And... When he wasn't looking, I picked a second one. And I framed this one, and it hangs in my office wow. today. And that's, that's the original tulip species from Turkey. So it looks, wow. in real life, when it was alive, it looked a little more grand than that, but not <coughs> much more? Not much, not no. much, no, it's pretty dull. Yeah. A little bit of, it's middle, a bit of a rose color in it, right. with kind of a creamy stripe. <clears throat> and that was it. And right. you know, it was really nothing to get too excited about. No. But if you want a good historic read, read about the tulip mania period okay. in the 1600s in, um, in the Netherlands. Fascinating, fascinating wow. slice of history it's where incredible. a tulip bulb was worth an extraordinary amount of money. <laughs> extraordinary. <laughs> wow. About $10 million in Canadian dollars today. Incredible. Does that have a botanical name? What's that? Does that have a botanical name? Yeah, um, just... It does, and I don't know it. <laughs> uh, something for me to figure out. <laughs> sorry, right. yeah, sorry. <laughs> we can edit that out. <laughs> but just to set the record straight, if the gentleman from the museum in the Netherlands is watching this, yes. the statute of limitations on this is, is uh, yeah. passed it's, now. It's, passed. it's yeah. now your yeah. property. Oh, your I sure hope so. I picked it in 2002, <laughs> and um, this is a few years later, yeah. isn't it? It yeah. is a few years. I'm just kidding. Don't pick a trillium. Yeah, that's a good one. Don't pick a trillium. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Mark, you think it's time? I think we've learned a lot today. We've had a lot of uh, interesting, informative, uh, yeah. but now let's have some fun. Okay, let's, let's I thought go. we were having fun. We're every day, we're having fun. And a different Mark. kind of fun. Okay, yes. we're gonna have more fun. More fun. Rapid yeah. fire. All right. Okay, Mark, this is where we do it. We ask you questions. Okay. Rapid fire questions. Okay. Could be a question, could be a choice. Yeah. And you give us Just your a best gut reaction. Gut Which one do you okay. prefer? I'll right. start. It could be dangerous. Thunderstorms or snowstorms? Oh, thunderstorms. thunderstorms. Oh, because yeah. yeah. it moistens the soil with yeah. a beautiful yeah. rain. Yeah. Yeah. And that yeah. nitrogen, it's, it's the lightning, of course. It, yeah, produced, yeah. it, it hammers nitrogen oh. into the soil. But lightning, so, I love watching lightning. So good. Yeah. Yeah. The lightning puts nitrogen in the soil? It does. Yes, it, does. Really? it charges the soil charges. with nitrogen. You ask any farmer um, yeah, how their crop, crop uh, performs after a good thunder lightning storm, right. electrical storm, they'll all give you the same answer. Oh, wow. my corn yeah. just took <laughs> off. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. Okay, next one. Apple pie or meat pie? 
Oh, apple pie. Oh. Apple pie. I, go, I have an orchard. I have my own apples. I, you do? So yeah, I do. Okay. But I don't cook. No. <laughs> so, but Somebody married, else makes the I'm apple pie. I'm married to cook. Yeah, oh, you yeah. did? Yeah. Okay. Lucy cooks too. <laughs> um, first concert you attended? First concert. Concert. The Beach Boys. Beach Boys. Oh. Yeah. You're the second person today that have said that. Really? Yes. Really? Wow. Down at the C&E? So it? we're In both Toronto? old. <laughs> 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 that was, I mean, they were all there. <laughs> they were all there. <laughs> I think they were. Uh, yeah, Carol King. Carol King. Might have been the second one I saw. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, if you could choose one single food that you could not give up, what would it be? Yeah, cashews. 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 Fresh roasted cashews with salt. Don't give them to me without salt. No. Right? You've got to have salt. It's, <laughs> yeah. like, it's like hot buttered popcorn. Yeah. It's no good unless it's butter, cashews. right? Exactly. Wow. you got to put, you gotta put love salt. Love cashews. So you carry those around with you I quite do. often? They're in my car. Do you want any? <laughs> <laughs> I often I buy the raw cashews and then, and then roast them in the microwave. Do you? Yes. That'd be good. My mom taught me that. <laughs> it's like I don't, didn't come up with that myself. Well, that's a good one. <laughs> um, one person, you've met a lot of people in your life, mm. right? Shook mm. a lot of hands, said hello, answered a lot of questions. One person you would like to meet that you haven't met? Wow. Um, Lee Iacocca. Lee Iacocca. Interesting. Yeah. Do you remember, you remember, he was like this legendary business guy who saved Chrysler and he went to Washington right. and he got a huge loan from Washington. How do you do that? Yeah. <laughs> number two. Yeah. Right. That's number one. Because Washington didn't do that. Number two, he paid it back. Yeah. Yep. He was he was the inspiration behind the Mustang. That's right. I I don't know. Yeah, and I never got to meet him, and I won't now, but jeez. Right. And I remember reading his book, Ayacoca. Sure. Um I think everybody read that book back in the day. And sure. at that time, it was quite an inspiration. It for me business wise. Yeah. Like it gave me confidence as a business person. I, geez, if he could do that, maybe I could do exactly. some of the things I'm dreaming about doing. Yeah. Good. For a while there there was required reading in business schools. Was it? To study the the, the business case and Italy Iacocca and what he did. Yeah. Absolutely. I can say that firsthand. Yeah. Well, it was a very readable book too. I didn't it right. never struck me as a textbook, like right. an academic book. Sure. It was a beautiful That's story. Awesome. Really. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, next one, Mark. Would you rather read a book or go for a walk? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I go for a walk, I've earned the right to read a book. <laughs> okay, so the walk first, I got a walk and the first. book. Yeah, okay. it's like you and I know each other through spinning classes at uh, fitness, right. right? And Mike and I have known each other for a little while, and I find that whether it's playing golf, a walk, whether it's I spin, whether whatever it is, it's that physical activity that has earned me the privilege to sit and read a book. And I love reading. Well said. Yes, mm -hmm. I really yeah. love reading, yeah. but I couldn't read all day. No. No, <laughs> no. it just it wouldn't work. Yeah, right, it's hard to sit around. Sure. Uh, okay, movie date or dinner date? A movie date or a dinner, or oh, dinner date. Dinner date? Well, you got to have conversation, yes, right? Of course. Mm -hmm. Yes. You're not an introvert. <laughs> so. I'm not an introvert. I'm not married to, well, I'm not married to an introvert, although she's a little shy, okay. but uh, the fact is I love Mary's stories and I think she enjoys some of my stories. <laughs> and uh, dinner, there's, there's something about like a, a lovely meal, a glass of wine, served slowly, mm -hmm but attentively, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. there's slow service that's bad and there's that's slow right. service that's extraordinary, sure. yes. right? So, nothing like it. There's nothing mm -hmm. like it. And, and, and then, you've probably been to Italy, and when every meal you yeah, have in Italy yeah. is just a performance, right. and they don't rush you, and they just yeah. take the time, and you enjoy yeah. the food better, and the whole experience is just amplified. Yeah, south of France, too. South yeah. of France. Yeah. And I like that their portions are smaller. That's right, yeah. Exactly. I don't need a lot, no. yeah. but exactly. the quality. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And Mary, very successful in her own right. Very Sorry, Mary? Very successful in her own right, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yarn shop on Main Street Unionville. Everybody it's talks true. about it. It's amazing. Mary's yarns. Yeah. Mary's yarns, it's yeah. true. <laughs> yeah. She knows a lot of people in Markham Unionville. Yeah, yeah. Right. And have you started uh, using, the, using the yarn, as they say? Using the, the yarn? Using the you yarn? You mean my yard? No, yarn. Have you oh, been the knitting? Yarn. Have you learned to knit? No, oh, no, 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 she knows a lot more about gardening than I do about knitting. <laughs> and I, 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 there we go. She offered, it's not that she didn't offer to teach me, <laughs> yeah. either, but 
No, no. I, no. So that's not one of your passions. It is not one of my passions. <laughs> no. But okay. if she, you know, I will say this: if she said, "I want to go to the Shetland Isles and I want to go to sheep farms and find out how they do it and dye wool and right. process wool," I would go on heart. Yeah, yeah. Right. And and she. And she says to me, yeah, but what are you going to do? I walk. <laughs> I, I would walk. <laughs> right. And I'd probably find a pub somewhere yeah. Yeah. that's a good distance away. And I would feel I earned that beer when I finally got there. There you go. <laughs> that to me sounds like pub. It does like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. We've got a couple more to go, Mark. The next one is roller skating or ice skating? Oh, ice skating. Ice skating. Yeah. I don't want to kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> really? You skated as a kid, did you? I did. Yeah. I did. Yeah, I played a little hockey. Okay. I love watching hockey. I'm not a big sports fan. I'm a big hockey fan. Okay. What team? That, well. I don't was born say it. Don't say it. <laughs> Women's College Hospital is yeah. two blocks away from Maple Leaf Gardens. Uh, yes. What do you think? Uh, the Habs. It was my team. Are you? Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> Well, I grew up in Fredericton, so you know you're. Not oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's that's got a lot to do with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Mark, you have a lot of talents. What is your hidden talent that you know, that people would be surprised to know that you are have this talent? A hidden talent. A hidden talent. Hidden talent. Ooh. <laughs> a hidden talent. That that's a surprise question. I don't, know if, that, I don't know if that's fair. Uh, uh, tap dancing? No. no, it's not tap well, dancing. You know, we're sort of journalists. Dancing. We don't ask questions ahead of time, right? <laughs> wow, wow. A uh, hidden a hidden talent would 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 just be. I love hospitality. Like I love it when we have people over to the house. And my only role, because Mary's the cook, mm. I just show them the garden. I try to make sure they feel good I feel I hope they feel welcome I do enjoy that yeah. and you know I've never said that to anybody and I hope the people that I count as friends uh, would say yeah Mark can do that I, yeah. I hope so yeah and That's there's right. there's a certain art to hospitality for sure, sure there right? is. and for sure there is yeah so being a good host for yes. other yes. people I, right? I think so yeah, yeah. yeah. okay yeah. do they come back because yeah. that would be Gen- good indication. Generally. Because <laughs> that would be a good indication. <laughs> yes. If they don't come no. back. Do they invite me back to their <laughs> <Yes>. place? <laughs> Not always. <laughs> okay, the last one. Uh, you enjoy music? You like to listen to music? I do. Yeah? yeah, I do. So, if you were to pick one song to go up on stage on a karaoke setting yeah. and sing this one song, <laughs> what would be that song of yours? And, and it, it can't be the good old hockey game, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> I can sing that. You can you? You know, I've sung it to all my grandchildren. Yes. Absolutely, Let's hear it. I have. Let's hear it. No, I'm not no, it. It. <laughs> But I think the answer to your question would be James Taylor, Up on the Roof. Up on the, the Roof. roof. James I, excellent song. Yeah, I love, yeah. I love that song. Right. And don't ask me why, but it paints for me a picture of actually being on the roof, like being above, right? Being above the human construct, right? And being right. part of nature and seeing the stars and feeling the wind and up on the roof, away yeah. from wow. traffic jams on the Don Valley Parkway. Yeah, almost flying, yeah. Yeah. floating yeah. up there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and he does such a beautiful job. I can listen to James Taylor for a long time. Oh yeah. Right. Do you play? Do you play that song? You just learn to play guitar. I'm you... just learning to play guitar, Good for and you. Uh, that is not a song yeah. in my repertoire. Yeah. But maybe I should well, add that. Yes. Yes. Up on the roof. Yeah. Good maybe. choice. Yeah. 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 I'd like to hear you sing it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The next episode. Okay. That's right. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's it. That's all our questions. It was very simple. You, you guys are good. Yeah. Bye. Anyway, thank, thank you very you. much. Appreciate Mark, it. Mark, it was a pleasure. Sure. It was really Thanks, interesting, Mike. informative, really. and fun. Yeah. And we thank you for joining yes. us. Yep. It was a special episode. We went extra long, so yeah. thank Good. you. And uh, your energy is stimulating. Stimulating, yeah. Yeah. And to all our audience out there, uh, again, thank you for tuning in. And make sure to go to lifestoriesmarkham.ca. Lots of more information about the podcast, YouTube, uh, how you can get in touch with us. So go on there and check it out and subscribe as well, please. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Mark. Thanks to all our guests. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.